<clears throat> it's my distinct honor and pleasure to uh, present the uh, next speaker. Ken Chumley has been speaking on this lectureship for quite a few years, and he proved last year that he's ready and willing to speak when he's not scheduled to speak. <laughs> we had somebody uh, had some car trouble or something like that. I can't remember who that was. Couldn't make it, so we had uh, uh, Ken fill in one of them, and of course Skip filled in the other. Are you filling both of them? Well, anyway, there's somebody else. <laughs> he filled in somebody else. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, but nevertheless, you know, you know, we're very pleased to have uh, uh, Ken here. He's preached with the Bellevue Belvedere Church in uh, uh, South Carolina, uh, North Augusta, I guess. Somewhere there, <laughs> somewhere there. Anyway, he's uh, done missionary work in a number of places, but he currently does uh, a lot of missionary work in, in uh, England. He goes there every year to assist those uh, congregations there. Uh, Ken is, uh, uh, you may not know it, but he's multilingual. He knows three languages. You didn't know that, did you? He knows the Queen's English. He knows... American English, and since he married a Texas girl, he knows Texcan. <laughs> and the problem is, though, he, he writes in all three languages, and I have to edit that. <laughs> <laughs> but we're very pleased to have him. You know, uh, Ken, I don't have an idea at all what you're preaching on, but <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> we switched deals just the right, right the last moment, so... Uh, whatever his topic is, I'm sure it has, it's going to be very controversial. And uh, truth, we, truth. I, I'm looking at it. Oh, here. Well, it was a different color. That, that threw me off. He confronted here about truth, and that's the truth of it. <laughs> Come speak to us. Certainly good to see everyone this morning. Had an interesting experience as I was coming in yesterday. Went through security in Augusta. And for the first time ever, my carry-on bag, they pulled it back and opened it up to check it out. And it turned out there was a suspicious item that they pulled out and then ran it through separately. The suspicious item, a Bible. I wonder if they'd have pulled a copy of the Quran in the same way. Usually when I travel, I don't carry a copy of the scriptures because I, you know, when I go to England, I have my Bible already over there. I've got so much stuff over there, I don't bother carrying most of it these days. It's certainly good to be here and have the opportunity of speaking again and dealing with the topics that we have this week. I believe it will be a profitable session for all involved. In John 18 and verse 32, Pilate asked the question, what is truth? Jesus was standing there before Pilate in the judgment hall. The question came about as a result of previous questions and some of the responses that Jesus had given. In verses 33 through 37 we read, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now whether Pilate had been seeking to sincerely know the nature of truth or not is open to conjecture. But many in answering, asking a similar question really don't want to know the truth when you try to answer their question. But Jesus acknowledged his kingship. 
and states that he had come into the world in order that he could bear witness unto the truth, and that those who are of the truth hear his voice. But what did Jesus mean when he used the term the truth? Jesus' concept of truth is seen in that he identified the word of God as truth. John 17 and verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now while the word of God does not lie, the Lord meant far more than this in his reference to truth. For both in this passage and in numerous others, Jesus used the word truth in an objective an absolute sense. To say that truth is objective is to say that truth is not changed based on the reception or the rejection of it by the hearer. Just in the same manner, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Regardless of how people may feel about it, it's not 5 or 3 or anything else. It's still the truth, no matter how one chooses to receive it. This it is with the word of God, the truth of God. Spiritual and moral truth does exist. And Jesus identifies it as being the Bible, the word of God. Thayer defines the term that Jesus used in this way, objectively. And that noun objective from whence comes the, ab the adverb objectively is defined in the dictionary as contrasted with subjective, not dependent on the mind for existence, actual, a matter of objective fact. In reference to religion, Thayer continues indicating that aletheia truth denotes the truth as taught in the Christian religion respecting God and his purposes through Christ and respecting the duties of man opposed alike to the superstitions of the Gentiles and the interventions, inventions of the Jews, and to corrupt opinions and precepts of false teachers, even among Christians. This simply means that God's truth in his word stands apart from all of the confused opinions and teachings of men. As such, it applies equally in all times, all situations, and for all peoples, unless it expressly specifies otherwise. Truth, therefore, is outside of the mind of the individual and is independent of one's feelings, likes, dislikes, and prejudices. The truth is attainable. That is to say that truth is there for us and that it is knowable and that it is unchangeable. Failure to recognize this with respect to the truth indeed has eternal consequences as all will be judged by the words of Christ. John 12, 44 through 50. Furthermore, if truth were not knowable and unchangeable, how would one be able to determine who was a false prophet? Jesus said, Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Unless there is absolute truth, such a warning would be meaningless. As we think about this topic this, this morning, we want to recognize, first of all, that Jesus is the truth. He was and is the perfect embodiment of truth. He described himself as the truth. That is the ultimate word or revelation of God the Father saying, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He didn't say that he was a way, a truth, and a life. There is only one truth, and that truth is found in him. He expresses the same fact in another way when he stated in what we commonly refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, when he said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, 
For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. It's a straight gate and a narrow way. Because Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He has the only truth, absolute truth, that leads to life. And thus we must recognize that when Jesus speaks, it is truth because he is truth. He not only lived the truth, but he revealed it to men and bore witness to it by his mighty works. John 1.17 tells us, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. In John 18.37, Jesus said, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Before he left this earth, he promised his disciples that he would send them the spirit of truth that would guide them into all the truth that they had not previously been ready to receive, John 16, 12, and 13. And so Jesus was telling the apostles that the words that they preached and the words that they wrote are indeed truth because God revealed them through the spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13. We need to recognize too that it is truth, truth and only truth, that makes one free. This truth is objective and absolute as we have noted. Thus it alone enables us to be free. John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Divine truth is indeed the only thing that can liberate man from bondage to sin and ignorance of sin. It is by the acceptance of and obedience to that truth that can set man free from sin. Romans 6, 17 and 18. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, i.e. the truth, which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness through continuing in the truth. Note, one is made free when he has obeyed the truth, which is the word of God. There's no other way to become a disciple of Jesus Christ than through absolute truth that is indeed knowable. Our Lord gave the very acid test of discipleship, that is continuing or abiding in his word. Unless one has obeyed the truth and continuing in it, the truth has not set him free. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. And try as one may, he cannot find any promise of salvation in the scriptures for any who do not obey the truth. The Apostle Paul asked, and we also must be ready to ask, to those who doubt or deny the absolute nature of truth, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4.16 one is now turn to look at some examples where Jesus confronted people with respect to the matter of truth. On one occasion, the chief priests and elders, and Mark and Luke's account also include the scribes, came to Jesus questioning his authority. By what authority doest thou these things? Matthew 21, 23. And who gave thee this authority? They're pivotal questions that all need to consider. We notice that our Lord, in response, placed the chief priests, 
the elders and the scribes on the horns of a dilemma when he responds with his own question. Matthew 21, 24, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by, the, why, by what authority I do these things. And then he asks them, verse 25, Matthew 21, the baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or from men? Now the chief priests, elders, and scribes now found them so themselves on the horns of that proverbial dilemma. They reasoned within themselves, knowing that whatever answer they gave, they were going to be in trouble. If they said from heaven, they knew Jesus would respond, why did you not then believe him? On the other hand, if they said it was for men, they feared the people because they believed John was a prophet. Again, Matthew 21. Thus they told Jesus they couldn't tell. And Jesus responded that he would not tell them by what authority he did what he did. The leaders of the Jews should have known and they chose to remain silent. By what authority? That's a question that we can ask of others concerning their religious teachings uh, and indeed can be asked of us. And we should always be ready to respond and be able to show that heaven's authority is behind all that we do in matters of religion. Interestingly enough, while I was preparing this material, I was involved in a, an email discussion with a liberal preacher in the area, congregation that had changed the sign outside of their building. It now reads with a beautiful graphic, NorthAugustaChurch.com. And then if you strain your eyes, because it's very difficult to read, underneath it says, A Church of Christ. They also changed their website that mentioned some of their unscriptural doctrines and practices. When I and the discuss and challenge the preacher for his biblical authority for what they were doing, he didn't offer any. His only response was the common liberal response. We are an autonomous congregation. Church autonomy allows us to do such. Well, I pointed out that congregational autonomy does not authorize any change to the doctrine of Christ, to the faith that was once delivered to the saints, Jude, verse 3. Before his ascension back to the heavenly Father, our Lord said, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, all power, authority, American Standard and New King James Version, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. When our Lord left the earth, he made provision for the continued faithful revelation of his will. He called and appointed apostles to take the gospel into all the world. He delegated authority to them for the purpose of binding and loosing, Matthew 18 and 18. He had promised that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth, John 14, 26, John 16 and verse 13. And thus a pattern for revealing of truth was thereby established. Christ, the truth, who possesses all power or all authority, delegated authority to the apostles who by inspiration of the Holy Spirit spoke and wrote the words that we find in our New Testament. And so the New Testament scriptures are both true and authoritative, possessing the very authority of God himself. The New Testament is therefore the word of God. It is absolute truth that cannot be changed. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Mark 13 and verse 31. Also have a section on tradition. I'm not going to spend much time here because Michael did an excellent job in dealing with the matter of tradition. But we do find where they tried to challenge Jesus regarding the traditions of the elders with the ritual washing of hands. And Jesus turns the question back to them again by asking, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Matthew 15 and 3. And he illustrates showing how they'd made the commandment of God of none effect by their tradition of Corban, Matthew 15, 4 through 6. And then Marx adds about the laying aside of the God of, command of God with their tradition of washing of pots and cups and many other things. And with these powerful examples, Jesus clearly shows how erroneous it was for them to bind tradition rather than truth, which teaches that when actions are based on the traditions of men, it makes man's worship of God vain. Matthew 15 and verse 9. By following the traditions of God, the traditions of man, excuse me, they were making the word of God of none effect. On another occasion, Jesus warns his disciples concerning the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew 16 and verse 6. The disciples reasoned among themselves, saying that this statement was made because they had forgotten to take some bread with them. Matthew 16, 5 through 7. When Jesus perceived that the disciples were thus reasoning, he goes on to say, verses 8 through 11, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have bought no bread? Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then the disciples understood how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, Matthew 16 and 12. Our Lord was warning them about the danger of erroneous doctrine that does not find its place in the word of truth, the scriptures. On another occasion, the Sadducees came challenging Jesus concerning the resurrection of the dead, a doctrine that they denied, Matthew 22, 23. And here we see again how Jesus in response brings the spotlight of truth on the error that they were believing and teaching. The Sadducees first quote from the law which taught that if a man died without having children that his brother should marry the widow and raise up seed for the deceased brother. Matthew 22, 24, quoting from Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6. Then they pose a scenario whereby a man dies childless. His brother marries the widow, but the second brother also dies without having had children, following through to the seventh brother who dies, and last of all, the widow dies. Matthew 22, 25 through 27. Then they posed a question to Jesus that they thought would trip him up. And show that the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead could not possibly be true. But the Lord was not in the least caught out by their questioning. Clearly showing the erroneous nature of the Sadducees' reasoning. Matthew 22, 29 through 32. You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? 
God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Matthew 22, 29 through 32. Let us just for a moment consider the matter of if there is no such thing as absolute truth. Remember our Lord had said, John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But if truth is not absolute, Scripture cannot be authoritative. But if the scriptures are indeed authoritative, as Jesus stated in John 17, 17, then they carry the authority for all that is done in religion. If the Bible is the word of God, then the Bible must be true, for God cannot lie. Remember Paul wrote Second. Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And furthermore, if the Bible contains traits beyond man's capabilities, then it is not the product of man's minds, but of God. And since the Bible contains predictive prophecy that is beyond man's capacity to be able to Bring forth, the Bible clearly is God's word. The fact that God cannot lie is clearly seen in such passages as Hebrews 6, 18. It's impossible for God to lie. Titus 1 and 2 where Paul wrote, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. In 1 John 2 and 21, John states that no lie is of the truth. And thus, since the Bible is God's word, it is truth, for no lie is of the truth. Thus, the Bible is indeed absolute truth. But just for the moment, what would be the consequences of the concept that the Bible is not absolute truth, and there is no such thing as absolute truth? Well, if there is no absolute truth, there can be no way of salvation because one must know the gospel in order to be saved. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. Thus for one to be saved, one must have an understanding of the truth. Peter writes, 1 Peter 1, 22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. And Paul in 1 Timothy 2 and 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And again, the Hebrew writer equated the knowledge of the truth with salvation. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully, that after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There's no such thing as absolute truth. As we indicated before, then there could be no such thing as a false teacher. And such would make the word of Jesus and his apostles a vain. How could there be a false teacher if there is no authoritative, absolute standard of truth? Well, this one teaches one thing. This one teaches another. But if there is no absolute standard, then all are going to be right. Just use an illustration. All of us go to the gas station to fill our vehicles with the gasoline. And as it seems to get more expensive every time we turn around. And some would like us to pay the same price as they are in Europe. You think it's high now? What about nine, ten dollars a gallon? But what if you went to one station and you filled up your vehicle and it said you had put ten gallons in, 
But you did the same thing when the car was empty the next time and it took 15 gallons to fill the tank. You said, something's wrong. Well, we have to have an absolute standard so that we know when we go to one place and we get 10 gall gallons of gasoline, we go to another place and that 10 gallons is the same. You think about the matter of time. How would we get on today if there were no absolute standard of time? You know, back years ago in the days of stagecoaches and uh, the, the like, even in England, time was not standardized. Each local pe place had its own standards of time. It didn't make much difference because you were traveling so slowly. But today, when you can travel the world and be from one place to another and the other side of the world in 24 hours, you need some kind of standard. These things are vital, and we recognize the, those in everyday life. When it comes to the matter of truth in the area of religion, oh, it doesn't matter. All roads lead to heaven. It doesn't matter what you believe. You can believe your thing, and I'll believe my thing. And in reality, it makes no difference. You know, it's bad enough when we see that in denominationalism, but when we see that same kind of thinking in those who claim to be members of the Lord's body, we've got a problem because there is a failure to recognize that standard of authority of absolute truth. Jesus taught that there were false teachers, Matthew 7, 15, and Matthew 24 and verse 11. Such statements cannot be ignored. Peter, Peter spoke of false teachers who brought in damnable heresies, 2 Peter 2 and 1. And John wrote in 1 John 4 and 1, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God. Furthermore, if there's no absolute truth, then there can be no true worshipers. But speaking with the woman at Jacob's well in Samaria, Jesus said, John 4, 23 and 24, But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That phrase in truth means according to the truth that has been revealed God's word. And since true worshippers are to worship God in truth, then in order for true worship to take place, the truth needs to be understood in order that true worship can be accomplished. And finally, if there's no absolute truth, then a judgment that is right and fair at the end of time could not possibly take place. But the standard of judgment has been set. John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him at the last day. How can such a be fair and righteous if there is no revealed truth? Well, briefly, what is man's responsibility to the truth? As man comes to the knowledge of divine truth, there are three basic responsibilities that he has to it. First of all, he must practice the truth. A mere acknowledgment of the truth of truth is not enough to save one, nor does it please him from hence come, came that truth. As man develops knowledge, responsibility becomes more dominant. Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Second, after practicing that initial truth, he is to preach it to all nations. Concealing the truth, that truth of mankind is a grave offense to the giver of that truth. Matthew 16, 15, and 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Then there is the preservation of the truth. 
Future generations must hear the unadulterated truth of the pure gospel of Christ as preserved in the New Testament scriptures. And thus sincere practitioners of truth should present this message. Jude 3, we read, Beloved, when I gave diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Yes, we have an obligation to contend for the faith which is the truth. Preserving of the truth entails not only being on the offensive, but also entails being on the defensive side of the battle, like the Apostle Paul was, Philippians 1.16, when he said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. As we started out, Pilate asked Jesus the question, what is truth? John 18 and verse 32. In Jesus' prayer recorded in John 17, he answers that question as we've noted in verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. During his earthly ministry, whenever he was confronted with error with respect to the truth, Jesus always, as we would say it, set the record straight. As he corrected error when it was set forth. In doing so, he set for us an example as to how we should confront any error regarding the truth. Remember that the truth is objective and it is knowable. An error can and must be refuted with the truth, which is the word of God. As I draw to a close, and I'm going to give back a little bit of time too, Kenneth. I want to just quote some words from the late brother Thomas B. Wallen that he recorded in the Gospel Advocate. He said in closing, Let me lovingly plead with brethren to recognize that to accept agnosticism, that is, we don't know, is to reject the Bible. And of course, to reject the Bible is to reject God, 1 Samuel 15, 26, and Christ, John 12, 48, John 6, 45. We can know the truth as to, one, what to do to be saved, and two, what to do to remain saved, and thus spend eternity with God, John 8, 32. It is impossible for us to really know, if it is impossible for us to really know these things, then for all any of us can know, Christianity is a farce, but it is not. Be thankful to God that you can know the truth, John 8, 32, Hebrews 10, 26, 1 Timothy 4, and verse 3. Amen. Now let me ask, is that, what is that? Is that, I'm asking you a question, is that Daniel's or is it Gene's? <laughs> And if you don't know what that's all about... I don't know what it's all about. What, what's it all about? It's about a Facebook conversation that uh, started of a picture of a, a cast iron skillet as people knew anything about them. And somebody made comment about that's why Gene's head is the same shape that it is. <laughs> and got the conversation going. And it wasn't me that asked that question. Well, we cleared that up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this, uh, this uh, message about truth is a foundational message that had really uh, do the, the church well to know that and abide by it. I was out in California at uh, Visiting Keith, you know, the family was out there visiting Keith, and <clears throat> of course, you know, he 
a professor at the uh, Naval Postgraduate School, and he invited me to to um, uh, participate or to attend, not to participate in a practice oral examination of one of their PhD candidates. And the first thing they did was on the board they drew had the the student draw a uh, hydrogen atom. You know that's the simplest atom that there is. And and I did you know I didn't know there were so many different states that a hydrogen atom could exist in. But me, you know, I'm soaking it all up because you never know when that might prove useful. <clears throat> <clears throat> but afterwards, uh, after it's all over with, uh, the, the uh, head of the department and uh, Key's colleagues, we all went to, to lunch. And I was questioning them about, you know, their, I guess, philosophy of examination, this, that, and the other. And I said, do you ever ask a, just a simple question, just a, and I asked, them, I asked the head of the department the question about, you know, the dog. I said, I want to give you a, a question. It's, it's a question of logic. You know, a dog, and this is not a trick question now. A dog has how many legs? He looked at me and said, you, you, you got to be asking. That's got to be a trick question. He said five. <clears throat> now, this, this guy is uh, he's renowned worldwide in this particular area of uh, physics. So he said five. <laughs> I said, no, a dog has four legs. <laughs> Unless you've got a dog that I don't know about. <laughs> it's got four legs. I said, now let's, uh, let's say we redefine the tail to be a leg. And I said, how many legs does a dog have then? He said, well, you know, five. I said, no, it has four. <laughs> it doesn't matter how you define a tail. A tail is still a tail. I said, all these fancy uh, formulas that uh, and it's, it's very esoteric stuff, but all these fancy, fancy formulas and what have you that you uh, put up on that blackboard, that is not creating reality. That is not creating truth. You're merely trying to de describe truth. And he said, well, yeah, that's right. So that's the nature of truth. Did you get a PhD that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a free lunch, that's even better. <laughs> So it's a very, very timely and uh, it's a well needed uh, topic, and I wish more people would uh, understand that. Now, David has some information. You need this? Uh, no, I, okay. at this crowd, you might. Uh, I was thinking about the old song Old Dan Tucker was a mighty man. He washed his face in the frying pan, combed his hair at the wagon wheel, and dyed the toothache in his eel. There's no water in it here. No, you can have it. <laughs> Sorry.